Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of In Kyle's Combo. Hope you're all well. And I hope it's it's as I say, as I say every single time, the, the response of like coming back after such a long time, I genuinely wasn't sure, to be honest. I wasn't sure. I was like, ah, because it didn't it hit, but then it kind of then I left. And sometimes when you go back to something, you're unsure, but it's great to see. But anyway, we've got a, a, another media guest, I'd say, and it's it's good to get them back on the show as we always have like you know, being able to bat back and forth from all, everybody that's in media can kind of relate to each other because you're all in it for a reason and, you know, you're very creative people, to be honest. But as uh, today's guest is Sam Lardner. How are you, mate? I'm really well, really well. Uh, as you can tell with the top, uh, England are playing uh, Scotland oh, yeah. today uh, a little later on. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. The, um, you know, and, you know, I appreciate, as I say to everybody, I'm like, you, you know, you were, you were actually like... Um, you know, you've moved house and, you know, and I appreciate your time as until like, because we had to wait for your interview and stuff like that. So I just want to ask you personally, did you manage to get everything set up in your house? Sorry. Certainly did. It was actually quite, quite a decent transition. Um, I was kind of moving around Christmas time. So you, as you can imagine, that's, you know, crazy busy, you know, letting agents are shut and whatnot. Um, so managed to do it in just a couple of runs, you know, got a, a friend with a minibus. Uh, always helps if you've got a friend with a minibus. Uh and just a couple, couple of, couple of runs, and yeah, uh, everything's great. You know, it's a really nice little spot. Good, good, good. Now you, um, you, and like I said to you before the the show, a lot of people either work for Bauer Media or Electric House. They're like the two powerhouses in media. I personally would say. And obviously, you've got other ones, but like the actual powerhouses, I would say, were them. Was now before we go into like your education and your history and things like that, the. What have you been involved in? Um, because you're the social media, you know, effectively like producer, so video editor, but producer as well, I would kind of say. So when you were in school and things like that, and left school and you know, university and stuff, before we actually get to that, is this where you where you were like, I see myself doing this sort of thing, or was there something else you see yourself doing? Um, I suppose you could say like kind of yes and no in two parts. I'll go with the yes first, and that's the fact that I just love editing videos like on kind of any level like we had to get into it in a little while but I've been able to you know work on film documentary you know all, all over different parts of the world and in different countries and stuff but editing's always been the real part that's I'm really passionate about because you know you can work with um, production teams you can work with all sorts of people and you know you're the kind of the last step of it where you're, you're actually putting the story together or you're putting you, you know you're putting your stamp on it through the edit and whatnot and it's you know it's the last kind of step in the process mm -hmm. before it's there ready to be delivered online or to a client or something um, and you know, the fact that I'm still doing that now, I've been in media about seven, eight years and I'm still doing that, you know, editing a different format, hundred percent in a kind of different environment, but I'm still, you know, very much video editing. So that's what I'm happy about. But did I think I was going to be like working in like social media in this capacity? Probably not. But for me, I'm all about when you see new opportunities come along, why not give it a go? Mm -hmm. Cause you have a, you have a, a, a YouTube channel if I'm right and saying actually subscribe to my channel. I appreciate that. And I subscribed right back. But uh, you have like 363,000 plus views. That's 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 a lot. How did you manage to build up that from? So, yeah, um, I, so I don't actually, I haven't you know posted something on there for a good few years now. Um, it was very much when kind of before I was in live events and stuff uh, before that, um, I used to do a lot of like short films and experimental films, even when I was at university. But when I spent some time freelancing, I'd be able to manage my time. And if I had a, an idea for a short or an experimental short, or even maybe a mini doc, um, I would have that time to, you know, put it together. Um, I've got a small team of freelancers and friends that are really good. You know, I've got my best friend is one of the best camera ops I've uh, ever come across and he's DOP'd on lots of films. And, um, you know, I just, I just go, right, I want to I shoot this. I want to do it, you know, maybe next month. I want to do it in three months and it's going to be, you know, micro budget or something. And I just do it. And quite a lot of time, yeah, I put those on YouTube. But even way before that, like when I was really young, when I was like side video editing, when I was like, I don't know, 14, 15, like Sony Vegas or something like that, or Movie Maker very back in the day. Um, I um, would just do like what we call fandom edits. So like supernatural TV series or like even Harry Potter when I was younger and just, you know, you, you would take all these and just create concept edits is what you kind of call them. But fandom's kind of the, the title and loads. That was huge on YouTube in the early part. Um, people just do like music video type stuff. And yeah, that, that, that was a lot of it, you know, came stemmed from those videos, but did, did quite okay on some of the experimental stuff. But um since then i've kind of always used vimeo just because i think it's cleaner platform for like short film or whatnot because youtube can be like so saturated that you can sometimes see your work just get lost 
Um, but yeah, it's it, it was it was really good back in the day. I think. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I think, I you know, as as I think as well as that, YouTube's kind of moving towards. Um, well, to be honest, either anything to do with cars, um, anything to do with gaming or podcasts. That's kind of where YouTube's going in a way because I think eventually YouTube. I don't think it'll ever overtake anybody like. Um, you know any any people out there that are predominantly on tv i don't think i'll overtake them but i do think that it, you'll now get like a version of tv specifically i know you have the app in that but it'll be way more advanced where you can literally search up titles and it'll kind of look like sky eventually but it'll be youtube wise i see youtube doing that to be honest with you Def, it's definitely like the next unless something comes out to overtake it and there's there's nothing youtube's the, like as Jeff Bezos said, um, Google and YouTube are like mountains. You can climb them, but you're never going to be able to move them out the way. That's effectively what they are, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, I, was, I was going to have a quick point just um, on YouTube as well. Like, I think there's two ends of it for YouTube for me, where you've got the real polished high end, where you would go and watch long form content, so, you know, 10 minutes plus and things that, you know, very you're going to go there you want to see that longer version whatever it may be you know like very much gaming like i know i'm a big avid gamer and i will sometimes spend you know 20 30 minutes watching you know some kind of gameplay or like a walkthrough or bits and bobs i will do that because i'm invested so it's sometimes maybe more your niche kind of content people are watch long form but you know I, i'm a massive say uh, walking dead fan and i'm re-watching all the series again and what i really like is i like um, audience reaction videos there actually is quite a lot going around and have them for years but there's kind of a lot of funny stuff going on with that on tiktok at the moment but um, just the ones where you literally you're watching people react to what you've reacted to in a show. And I actually love it. And it's a mix of, you know, UGC, user generated content sent in where they actually edit in with the TV show stuff. Um, you know, I don't know how they quite get around all the copyright stuff of it, but to watch, you know, as an audience, I think it's fantastic because you're literally just watching, you know, that mix of high end content with UGC. And I think that works really well on YouTube. Um, and yeah, to be honest with you, I, I usually watch it, but I watch it for... Um it's a little bit different i watch it for like not like world's strongest man nothing like that like amateur weightlifting competitions and obviously it's owned the right it's the rights is owned by for example the ipf which is power international powerlifting it's actually owned by them you're not allowed to like put it on youtube yet people put it on youtube with them reacting to it I'm, i don't know how that works because copyright as you say is a thing i've, I've never i've tried to like write in the comments go and dm me so you can tell me how this i know if this works but i've never got anywhere with that but yeah, I think it's, yeah. it's definitely a grey area. I mean, like I say, I've consumed a lot of like stuff like that. And sometimes you do watch it and you go, because, you know, I would say practice what you preach and I will watch it. And you do feel quite guilty in times like that when you're like, OK, there, the, you know, I, you know, we wouldn't do something like that because you know, I can't imagine how many copyright things it breaches. Um, but yeah, there is, it is weird because YouTube over the history over the years has got better at that, you know, the way it can analyze, you know, waveforms of audio and you can have all your ID strikes and stuff the way it can, you know, it can spot audio tracks and video or whatnot you know i've been subject to that in the past you know as i was saying we did you know fandom edits where what you literally you know you're editing concept kind of videos based off of film and tv so of course you know you don't own the rights to that so you know you, you kind of learn along the way but it's very much i think practice what you preach on it yeah yeah exactly exactly now for yourself um you were uh, you went you went um to university to do media production which is actually funnily enough what i'm going to be doing not at coventry mind you but hopefully at sunderland but um so with you being it, it's kind of, and from the outlook anyway and the way we've been speaking that you correct me if i'm wrong but as you said you've always known you were going to do video or be involved in media is that my correct in saying that but yeah 100 if um I always call it judgment day plan, which is like, as you probably know exactly what I'm going to say here is that, you know, you have that, you know, you have your thing here, you're going to do it. That's it. For example, you immediate edit in hundred percent, but then there's like a thing that's kind of like slightly going to happen or something like that. You know, maybe if this didn't work out, what was this? If did you, you know, I hate, I hate saying it because like sometimes it's, it's very like, um, it's not demotivating as such. I'm sure you get what I'm trying to say, but it's not like, you know, it's kind of good to have a little backup plan just in case, you know, Obviously, we had a pandemic and stuff like that. So, but what was your, what was your, what, what was, or maybe even still to today, in fact, actually, what is your backup plan if like media didn't work and things? That is, that is a really tough question, Carl, to be fair. I mean, I, I could tell you about something that, um, I could tell you a quick story about an opportunity that I had that I, I didn't take. And, you know, in terms of an example of something that like I regret, but there was reasons why I didn't take the opportunity. And 
I managed to do like to, uh, when I was in university, I managed to do kind of a couple of months shadowing as like a, a runner and shadowing some of the editors on um, working for Ardman uh, Animation. So um, yeah. if you don't know, they're based in Bristol. So they, you know, they've made like Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run and stuff like that and Sean the Sheep and things. And, you know, the work they do is incredible. Like if there's a longer, longest possible way to make a film, that's what Ardman do. But it's <laughs> incredible the work they do. Um, and it was literally one of the best experiences going. Like I literally stayed in Airbnb, but the money was good and I could actually afford it from what they were paying, even just as, as a runner. Um, and it was such a good, good opportunity just to listen and learn. Like one day they were like, you know, can you help us move all the old chicken run sets? And I'm like, you still have them all. They're all in the warehouse. And I go in and I'm like, I love that film as a kid. And, you know, you're literally there and obviously, you know, the puppets are only so big, you know, there's like an entire film, uh, entire team, just on like faces. And, you know, they did the two months there, incredible. And they said, you know, you've done really well, you know, like it's well, a couple of weeks following once I was back home, you know, and they, they were like, we, you know, we, we'd actually want to offer you a job. And I was like, wow, to work in, in film, you know, they were working on Early Man at the time, which lead was like Eddie Redmayne was the voice. And you had like Timothy Spall and some amazing talent, um, Maisie Williams, they were all, you know, and they would come in and stuff. I was like, wow, the, you know, you're getting into film just in a different avenue. But I was so dedicated to my degree I was like I've worked so hard for students this was around second to third year and I had good good ideas for my my FMP my final project at the end of the, the three years and I just was like I couldn't do it because you know it's in Bristol I, I just I wouldn't be able to do uni in this full-time demanding job working on a film uh, in, our, in in Bristol so I turned it down and they they I actually knew someone who got that job and the fact like they, they took it there was kind of a couple of positions and I know someone that got it and I'd, I've seen where they've gone the last kind of well, five years I think or five or six years ago it was and they're, they're like you know I think like third second AD now and they're they're working they're working on chicken run two at the minute they're actually working on the film that's shooting now and it's like you look at that and go you know I believe everything does happen for a reason, but you know, that's their path and that could have been my path, but you know, I chose to focus on the degree and do it the best I could make sure I got come out with the degree, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, it is, you do often, I do look back at that one and go, Oh, what if, you know, but it would have meant probably moving to Bristol and everything with it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it, Everything does happen for a reason, but in my and the way I always look at it as well, it's like that's fair enough in saying that. And obviously, then you get the whole um, you have to be lucky to be put in. You know, you have to be. Sometimes it's just being lucky, but there's a there's a knack to putting yourself in positions of quote unquote being lucky. I think there's you have to be good at doing that. It's not just that type of thing. As well as yourself, and it would, it would mean um because obviously universe that this might sound really stupid. It probably does, but I'm taking it your uni was actually in Coventry, like Coventry Uni is in Coventry itself. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, the, the, they're constantly building like new buildings around there and stuff like, you know, um, all of my family are based from Coventry anyway. So like, the, you'll hear a lot of people will say there's a lot to suit the younger generations and because, you know, we've just been with city of culture for 21, um, you know, so it is such a diverse place, but then the older generations, people that have lived there 60, 70 years, there's not so much for them people are saying at the minute now mm. but for, for someone coming in for that university their campus experience now it's fantastic i think it's a brilliant university yeah you would you would you would have had to literally move um your whole life over to bristol i know it's not it's still in the uk you know i don't know how far a distance it is to be honest with you i'm not really i'm not really a geography guy so i don't know how far things are away from each other i know like where roughly where it is but you still would have had to move your whole so it's a big move but then again obviously you've landed in to be honest with you and i'm not i'm not trying to get a job here or nothing like that. i'm just being honest but everybody i've either spoken like i said to you before i've spoken to people um in electric house and honestly like it's it's one of the com it's one of the very few companies that i've spoke to where and bauer media is another one that people have constantly been said nothing but great things about it so clearly you've landed yourself on the feet and again that's not just in case anybody electric houses that i watch us that's not me trying to get a job it's just your staff are really your staff i'm just just being honest your staff are like the nicest people ever even though like like we were talking about before some people would rather stay behind the camera which fair enough but the, the, they just have like such a nice way of telling you rather than telling you no no full stop and you're like okay what's well, just out of curiosity what's the reason and they're like we don't need a reason they give you like full reason why and mm -hmm. it's just some like you're saying some people you would rather be behind the camera but you then worked you actually worked at your uni in the shop as well um do you want to tell us a bit about that yeah so it, it, this is like i mean there's i could 
talk a lot of positives about coming to university, but one of the perks was the fact that there was the, the loan shop, so the kit shop. So you think of a media production, it was the Ellen Terry building is the, the main building for media, but you'd have like audio, theatre, you know, all those courses in there. So you'd have all your like, you know, filming, all your camera, audio equipment and whatnot, but then you'd also have things just for like the audio degrees, so, you know, lots of high-end mics, you know, drum mics, all that kind of stuff. And they would have like two main kind of technicians who like headed up and looked after the shop, but then they would always employ a team of maybe six to eight students across the media degrees uh, they would have, have an opportunity so you'd literally send your cv in like it's a job but it's through the uni and you still get paid for by the university like all the lecturers and whatnot would um but you know you get to kind of have that experience you know you can you can actually do your degree whilst you know having a decent part-time job you know in the same place you're not putting yourself out traveling wherever and you've been able to in that time you know learn lots of different cameras because you would do lots of things in your own course but you know that has to go around like 200 you know students in a, in a you know in a whole cohort in a year so being there just two of you are maybe a four or five hour shift if it wasn't very you didn't have many bookings and there wasn't people queuing up you'd have that time to maintain the kit so by doing that it means you can put it on have a play around with a camera dslr any of the bigger black magics and things that we used to have and you can you know and it, you just that's i think the the fundamental of why I, I was able to work with so much kit later on in life because i'd, I'd spent all that that kind of year just playing around with so much equipment maintaining it looking after it seeing how it worked because you know we were responsible for it going out and coming back um so we'd have to know how it worked for when we test it when it came back in case you know because unfortunately things do get broken uh when it, they go out you know students do break stuff there has been quite a few stories where stuff has come back with bits missing stuff all over it and like you know you're like where have you been shooting you know um but yeah it was it was a really good job yeah good good now you were a freelance but you some of the stuff you told me you worked on is it's it's incredible but like you were a freelance um videographer after that um i take it that was that was that just um to again to give yourself a bit of experience in the industry and like give yourself a bit of knowledge or was that because um you just you just were like you know what i kind of want to go myself what was the what was the reason behind that yeah i think it was there's was a couple of reasons i think there was definitely a bit of kind of you know very much after uni finding yourself i mean I'm not going to lie, you do sometimes look at the percentages of people that finish a degree and then go into a job in that field. It probably is lower than, than you think, I'm sure. I'd like to see a number on that, to be fair. Um, but I know very much in the circles I was with, I know there's only maybe a handful of people that are actually in a media job or at least practicing media or some, you know, uh, sort of creating stuff. Um, but me, me and a good friend, I'll mention his name, Ezra Lease, he's the, the camera up I mentioned before. He's, he's such a talented chap. And we were always doing like little short films and bits of Bob. So quite often in that final year, first year, you know, the freelancing, some of it was like, you know, freebies and stuff. You know, we used to get paid in food, which very much at the time, you know, when you do the early jobs, you're happy with that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it was just that first year was just a room to learn how do you like start pricing stuff, you know, viewing yourself um as more than you know a freebie or getting paid in this and that in favors actually learning how to price yourself equipment how to you know work hours you know how to charge for labor kit editing you know doing it all properly mm -hmm. um and then it was you know there was never like a goal of like this is what we're gonna do you know for the for the next foreseeable this was just that first year of us going right we've got a few jobs few people we know we'll do a few bits and bobs but then, yeah, I only did that for, yeah, not even probably best part of a year. But through that, I actually started freelancing for the company that I'd later work at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. The, you know, I always say to people as well, is it's, it's like, um, <clears throat> it's another way to look at it. Because you did, if I'm, you know, if I'm writing what you just said as well, is that you did it whilst you were at uni. Is that is that correct? Or was it like summer times or things like that? Or was it both, in fact? Yeah, so it was, yeah, probably both. So I did, uh, I kind of started doing a couple of jobs during second year and then a lot through third. And the lecturers and the team, they were fantastic because um, they they were so supportive in the fact that, you know, there's modules telling you about preparing yourself for the world of work in media. You know, it can be a cutthroat business and you've got to, you know, you're probably going to get a lot of no's and stuff and, you know, you've got to be realistic with it. Um, so 
to actually be doing freelancing and giving it a go in second year, they are all for that. And yeah, quite often I did used to miss lectures and I never missed a deadline. I always made sure my work was done, but I would, you know, miss lectures or miss some tutorials. But when I explained, you know, I'd never just, you know, not turn up or anything like that for the sake of it. I would always say, right, you know, Steve Dawkins, he was the head lecturer, he's a fantastic chap. I would let him know, I'd be like, right, I'm doing this job. Sometimes I miss lectures because I was doing a job for him. So I used to do some jobs for the lecturers, which was fantastic. They sometimes would have a hand team like we did. We, we did like a documentary that we managed to send off to a few festivals and it got um, it got nominated for a Royal uh, Television Society Award, which was incredible. Mm. Um, I didn't get to go because I was, I was the editor on it. The editors never get to go to anything. It's <laughs> directors, producers, stuff like that. Um, but he literally, it was his idea and stuff. He was doing it, you know, outside of uni university, but he was able to ask students who like, you know, had worked with him and actually were up for it and kind of knew what they were doing to, to come with him. And they went and shot it in Iceland um and then you know I, I got to edit it i didn't get to go there obviously but you know that that's one of many opportunities i could tell you about that literally were the foundation that they came from the, the lecturers themselves um you know they would put things out you know there was one one like kind of lecturer would often say you know do you want to go and shoot weddings and stuff and we used to have facebook closed groups that you know you could join if you wanted to put yourself out there and try and go and shoot something edit something and potentially get paid you know whilst you literally second year you know um so yeah. I, I was lucky yeah yeah you you yeah the it's kind of it, to be honest with you it's, it's, it's funny you say that i was just thinking that when you were speaking i was like you know that's it it does seem to the same thing that if you get a degree um i'm sure you'll agree might agree with this if you get a degree um we'll just say it's a it's a and it's a pass and then i get a degree, if someone else gets a degree and pass and then somebody else like yourself like you know person one hasn't has got a degree person two has got a degree and has got a lot of work behind it. It's been like constantly powering and stuff. That person's going to get the job over you, even if they get a worse grade, because they know that they've got the experience and not having to teach you and stuff like that. Would you say that as well, especially nowadays with so many? I mean, anybody that's applying for a uni that's watching this will know, like myself and that, um, you know, you get an email saying, by the way, there's been a lot of students on this course. So you kind of do need to like make yourself stand out now more than what you used to be able to because of, they're so popular nowadays. So would you say it actually is a kind of benefits you to be have the extra, we'll call it extracurricular activity outside of uni as well? I think I'd, I'd probably say 100% because it, it definitely de depends on like what degree and what field um, that you're working in because, you know, there's, there's often that conception of like, you know, um, people with degrees and then people, you know, with work experience out there and people will go down that line. But for me, the degree is very important in the fact for me, it taught me a lot of skills that made me go from like here to here um, because I was able to, you know, have access to the Adobe suite, which before I just used things like, you know, bits I'd be able to like Cyberlink PowerDirect back in the day, some Sony Vegas, but being able to have the Adobe suite, uh, the, the course gave you a Mac, which I still have to this day, like eight years later, still somehow running. Got a new nice baby at the minute. Uh, but the old the old thing is, yeah, eight years old, but they actually gave you it. I mean, I did joke. I'm sure a lot of people probably join that course just to get a free Mac, you know, each to their own. But they give you a Mac and, you know, you, you had the, all these tools. They give you the Adobe Education License. And they were like, you know, go away. You've got that then. You can then go and learn and do all your bits and bobs. So then I was able to use that tool to freelance for the uni and outside. And they actually were like, go for it. Um, so, you know, with all, but half the time, those opportunities all came from the university. So I look and say all that experience, yes, I took it on and did it on my own, some of it on my own back, but a lot of the initial kind of conversations and um, contacts and stuff that was made was from the university. So even though I was learning the skills, that experience was still coming from the fact that I was doing this degree. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I, I just, I think when people say, oh, you know, you need to have lots of work experience and that, I was like, well, that has actually come as profit, you know, of the the degree in the university and the people that I met and contacts I made at uni. Um, and it's it's really weird. I mean, the, the, um, the chap who actually got me involved with the company that we can speak about in a bit, that I worked for four years in live events, he actually had done my course several years before me and loads of freelancers I've met um over the years have, have actually gone oh yeah i studied at cov or what you study media production oh me too or someone has studied audio and like it's so weird because when you're especially around the midlands and stuff especially in live events you will hear appeal because it's such a good uni um especially for media you end up just meeting people and then you ask oh what year were you at or was that lecture still there and stuff um but yeah ultimately i think you know you, you've got it you can't just go out with it with a degree you know you'd be lucky it, it just it just helps you need that experience because you'll be more confident 
to maybe apply for those roles that you wouldn't have before if you've gone out there and done jobs beforehand? Yeah, I think, I think, and that's what a lot of people forget as well, that the fact is like, you have to like, there's, there's only, you know, it's like, um, it's like run. It's like as a good a good example was there was a guy in um, London. I don't know if you've heard about this at all, but a guy in London and uh, was wanting a job in finance, and he was in Canary Wharf, and he was like, I don't know what to do here. So and uh, he got a, a billboard and wrote what he'd done um, on a billboard, his degree and stuff like that, and stood outside the offices, and everybody was like, You'll never get a job. He had people coming out and tell him you'll never get anything. There was then there was an interview day. And uh, he walked in. I can't remember the guy. I wish I knew the guy's name because I could shout him out. But um, he came in. I uh, could remember the guy's name, as you say. He came in and he actually got hired on the spot. And uh, people were like, what difference does that make? He's got nothing. It's like, yeah, but he's been stood outside the office for the last three weeks, day and night, 20, pretty near enough 24 hours a day. But it wasn't, obviously. That's He was making himself look. He knew when their lunch hour was, so he was standing there. So it made him look like he was out all the time. He wasn't really. But uh, he actually talked himself getting into a job and he was like, yeah, the only reason I got this, he was like, the only reason you got this is because you were completely different from the average, I've got a degree guy, because degrees are coming, like, they used to be very scarce, but now everybody's got one. So you do need to have that bit that kind of singles out a little bit. But yeah, you work, um, you know, just, you know, with the live events and stuff like that, I'm, I'm going to end up getting this name wrong, by the way. It's no disrespect to the company. I just, I'm not very good with names, but um, is it Lemon, Lemon Zest? Is that how you say it? Yeah, that's well, it. You got it in one. I, well I, done. I, right, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I get companies named wrongs and I'm like, oh no, but I just, I've just been dyslexic. Sucks. But anyway, um, with uh, the, you were a, a media designer. Um, with them and you managed to work your way up to the head of media production how did you manage what like was that was that a natural progression from the freelance or were you like you know what I kind of just want to go into this now I think so you know the, you hear a lot of conversations about what what opportunities are available just on the back of freelancing quite a lot of the time um, you know you might be able to specialize later on but to start with you're probably gonna have to do the corporate circuit at some point um, or like awards it depends you know where very much where you are where you're willing to travel if you can drive and all that if you can drive you can do pretty much whatever um, you know and obviously what kit you've got does help but I managed to I did a job uh, for Green Gorilla Films they're called and they actually were three chaps from Cov Uni studying media in previous years who set up just a little company and it was they set up Blue Ridge um, weddings so they shot weddings and then they had Green Green Gorilla Films for a while and they moved out to you know offering bespoke packages you know corporate you know VTs videos promo videos all that stuff and I was managed to just do jump on a small team just doing a runner job again um, when I was in in uni um, and they were doing like a it's like a, a side piece for Sky Sports for South Coast Warehouse so, you know they have like the eye dents so you're watching football and it'll be like sponsored by Sky Sport you know or sponsored by uh, South Coast Warehouse and it'd just be a 10 second shooting a load of those and it was a great little shoot Midlands based actors but then they had they had Ewan McIntosh on there that if not like, if people don't know him if you watch the original office he was the Scotch Egg guy I think Keith his name was um, and like you know he does a lot of Midlands stuff um, and he was on it and it was a great opportunity and through that I just said you know if you've got any more stuff because like, you've done a good job you know it's only a three four day shoot um you know if you've got any more like filming editing bits anything please put me forward you know I'm, I'm looking for work and then Dave Hanna was the contact I got who was working at Lemon Zest and he was the head of media and he just said yeah we need someone to come in a few days a week um just help with edits to start with so I was like yeah and I went in and I thought I was just gonna be signing someone and I literally went in he was like yeah do you want to do an edit Actually, at the time, I had my stepdad drive me. Like, I thought it was just be a half hour quick chat. And I just phoned him going, yeah, I'm doing a day's edit now and I'm here. So, yeah, he had to go back, bless him. Um, and from there, yeah, they eventually, after I think a couple of months, they took me on uh, full time as a, like, they called it a multimedia designer, which kind of sounds fancy. You know, it's just because of the breadth of work you do. So you'd be editing, then I'd be out shooting. Um and then I'll be working with like the smaller kind of media team they had there and with freelancers. And then you'll, you know, you could be doing work like design and like Photoshop or in design and stuff, you know. Um, so it was just, I think that the title was there because it was such a breadth of work. Mm. That's, that's the, the thing is, as well, again, it shows that, you know, you, 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 and not to talk you up too much here because like it's, you know, I'm doing a lot of it, but it's because it's because you deserve it. To be honest with you, you seem to have a knack of like putting yourself in the like the right positions at the right time. You're one of those type of people, if, if I'm correct in saying that, just well, the way I mean, the way it's kind yeah. of structured out to go from freelance and then oh I turned up and then I'm editing and then they were like yeah. and that talked you into a job and 
you, you like I was saying to you before, you have one of your very like, well, like in, well, I was actually saying it, now I'm actually saying it to you. You have a knack of putting yourself in the right position. I try my best. My, my head's going to explode, Kyle, if you keep keep giving me all this love. I appreciate it. But yeah, I've, just, <laughs> I've been very fortunate and very lucky. Like I, I always say, I'm the, the, the product of the people I've met. Yeah. Like 100%, you know, like I certainly try my best, but I'm always listening and learning and just staying humble all the time. Like that's the most important thing, you know, never getting above your, your merit. I mean, like uh, it's really random, but I, have you ever watched, I, I forget the title of it now, but have you ever watched the series? Um, it's like the round, it's like a round table and they have like the famous actors and whatnot. If you ever watched it on YouTube um, and they'll get loads of amazing actors together and they just talk like this, you know, it's very much, you know, this is where you'll be going. Um, <laughs> is it, I appreciate that. Is that like the, the, um, those two, because Conan O'Brien did one. Um, the guy that the presenter he yeah, did yeah, one with yeah. the Simpsons because he started off in the Simpsons the round table yeah, thing yeah. but like uh, Willows is it Willows Smith is it Willow is that her well, name well that's what Wilson no no you know um, no, Will cool. Smith's wife is that oh uh, Jada Jada Pink Jada, Smith. That's she does the whole round table I don't know if that's yeah. where you're going with this but uh, so it's one I think that's maybe to do with Sky Movies or it's the Sky so you know you have Zach um well, I've lost his name as well, but he does, you know, often like features for Sky. Like there's been, you know, an awful lot of Harry Potter recently because they did that special 20 years. All right, yeah. But they did this one um, and they had the round table. They had like Tom Hanks, De Niro. Um, who did they have? They had um, uh, Shia LaBeouf. Is that Shia LaBeouf? I always get his name wrong. Apologies. Um, <laughs> but they had all this wealth of talent and they just talk about, you know, what's gone right, what's gone wrong, just very similar how we are. And this one thing that Tom Hanks says, I hope I don't get this right, but he says, these words, this too shall pass. And I've, I've, I actually adore it because he goes, you, you know, you're having a really hard time. You've got loads of no's. You're getting shut doors all the time. This too shall pass. You're smashing it. You're getting job after job. There's lots of money coming in. You're getting all this experience. This too shall pass. You know, you never, things aren't, mine, aren't, aren't always going to stay incredible, like on the, on the up, up, up all the time. There's going to be a level out. Things are going to hit you and stuff and potentially knock you down. Yeah. So it's staying humble on both sides. And I just adore that quote. And literally like the whole table, like you know, they all like light up at it because it's just so simple, but it's, it's so good at it. Cause you go, you're feeling crap. This too shall pass. You know, you think things are going absolutely amazing and great if they are, but this too shall pass because that's life. You're going to have mixes of it. And just uh, the outcome of that is just by staying humble and just, taking it as it comes um yeah i think that's just super important yeah it's it's true and i think that um again everyone's I'm, everyone i'm saying is just truthful to be honest but i think that having a a, a a level head as they call it no matter it's because everything like but you kind of in, in, in another way to look at it though you have to think about it as well is that you kind of have to have that um everybody's gunning for your job type thing so you kind of have to be there's like two sides. You can never be like, as they say, you can never be too comfortable. Like never, like in a position because you don't know. But you can never like there's being humble. But then it's like you do need to be a kind of a little bit of like a, you know, happy and pleasure about where you've been, what you've come from, and things like that as well. It does come down to that. But now for the 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 company that I seem to be praising a lot, and I don't even work for, and I've never applied for a job. But I've just seen that now, Jeremy. Haven't even though people are going to be like, you're clearly lying. But I'm, I, I tell you, I tell you—I have I genuinely have not. I, just I've seem, never seen him before. <laughs> yeah, 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 I've never even heard of the company before. <laughs> no, they just—they genuinely seem like a good company. But anyway, um, Electric House is this social media video editor. But what I, what I do want to ask though was, why did you leave uh, Lemon Zest to go to Electric House? What was the reason behind that? So it, I, I'm not gonna lie, it was absolutely incredible job. I, mean, I was there for four years. I managed to to head up the department, and you know it was incredible. And we we did go through a period of change a couple of times, but um, I will not lie, it, it was crazy kind of uh, hours and whatnot. You you always put in when you get out with a lot of stuff, but you know the longest shift I ever did was about 22 hours um, working on uh, a car reveal, and it was insane because quite often we would rig show derig, and we were a smaller team. We would bring freelancers in to relieve at certain points because we were full-time we were you know we had our own kit we had a huge warehouse full of kit we'd go in and out manage the in doing it and the out and quite often you'd have to do a rig show de-rig you know and you'd sometimes be rigging midnight through the morning do the whole show and yeah 22 hours was the longest but quite often 12 hour shifts were a minimum 
that was just standard. Like a day rate in live events is 12 hours generally. If you get below that, then you're lucky. A day and a half would be, yeah, 18 hours. So 18 hours was kind of a standard. And yeah, when it was busy, like show season, September, December, you would be working. I once worked three weeks straight without a day off. 21 days pretty much I had to work weekends because I was behind on edits and I had to go in the office um so it was all but it was all good fun because we had such an amazing team but then through the pandemic we had some people leave their own accord and through the pandemic some of the key members of staff and stuff had to be let go unfortunately um and then the rest of us were like fur furloughed um they were actually tell like they were actually like let go and then they were brought back and furloughed and whatnot and um you know that was all, all well and good and you know we we I lasted like a like throughout that, you know, quite happy, you know, because it is what it is. We were going through a pandemic. It's about keeping people safe. And then when we come back, we we're on a reduced staff. Um, and eventually those people that were furloughed were, were let go. And um, we then decided, right, we're going to build, we've got this kit. We built a studio in one of our like sister warehouses and it looked really nice. So we had like LED kind of totems and a big, you know, studio kit with like three or four cameras that, were, that could move around and adjust and we could customize it. So I used to like rig LED panels and vision mix and stuff on the side with this job. That was something that I learned at Lemon Zest. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of built all that. We were able to facilitate a lot of jobs because instead of them being in person with 500 people, they were online with all the 500 watching via a live stream to YouTube or Vimeo or whatever. Um, so like, that was all, all well and good, but because then we were such a small team, it then was like there was so much pressure that I felt quite personally on a lot of it um, because of the demand. Because previously I would create short films and highlight films from an in-person event. So the whole event was the big thing. And then we had a small, the media would be a secondary offering for a client. So would you like a film, a highlight? Would you like some interviews done with it? Would you like some opening VTs, all that? But now the whole event was this media product. This that, that so like because it was a live stream or it was a pre-recorded live. It was a ninety-minute edit with four cameras, a big multi-cam cut with loads going on, and that was obviously you know I'd gone from being a small but still important kind of part of an event to literally the entire event. The end product is a video or it's a live stream. So mm -hmm. the the pressure was immense, um, and I, I just I just was like, you know, I, I was just just not my head my, my heart wasn't in it I do remember someone saying that my heart wasn't quite in it anymore and you've got to sometimes acknowledge that um, and it was very difficult leaving because I had become very integral in the company and it was nice to hear that but I, I just kind of had to had to change things up um, and I was very open to opportunities at that time because you know I'd done so many crazy things and had this crazy four years which was insane but I was like I like the idea of maybe taking a step back and going more, more to like a nine five just for a bit. Some people go, well, oh, nine five, you know, what's that anymore? I'm like, you know, it, when you've worked those kind of hours, it's like, you know, I'd like to go with something, you know, like just a standard nine five, five day week, and then be able to do things on weekends a bit more and just, you know, have something with that where I can still have room to do other things. Um, and this opportunity came along and, and yeah, I, um, I just ne never looked back. Yeah. Like, so you know, you're the as you, as I said before, you're the social media video editor, which is like, like we said for the podcast, it's kind of like it's kind of like producing as well, just the way you've got to do stuff, content. Like obviously, it's not it's not literally producing, but it kind of is. But do you want to explain to us a bit about, about, about like what your um, we'll say like what an average day is for yourself would be a good one. It's yeah, it's it, it kind of no no two days are the same, but you well you have a couple of bits that are kind of always kind of consistent. So um, as a social media editor, it's it's kind of you, you you are a social media coordinator, so you do kind of you know structure and organize content for you know online communities and pages. So for instance, I run. Um, so if many of you viewers have heard of on the tools, we're a, a trades um, a trades kind of based community. So serving trades people um, that work in the construction industry um, and it's generally entertainment type content. So it was born about from UGC style content. So user generated clips that were sent in like a you've been framed type of thing uh, cut together and, you know, put together based on a theme. But it's grown tremendously to kind of, you know, six seven million followers collectively and and we've broadened out to other platforms like TikTok. we recently hit we're on 1.1 million uh, followers we hit a million literally the other week which was huge on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um we do well on youtube we have snapchat and instagram offer to twitter and linkedin so we have all that offering and it's kind of grown to that and with, with my job it's a social editor so you do a bit of coordinating but also you get to edit some of the content have those opportunities but then a big part of it is looking after community because we're very much community first. That's the most important thing with on tools and electric house. Um, so by being community first, you know, you're always considering what the community wants, what they enjoy, constantly analyzing the data to kind of edit content, create content 
that's going to suit the audience better they're going to enjoy it more um like we have we have two original teams that are fantastic and they have producers videographers editors and we literally create original content sketches mini docs stuff like that, challenge videos mm -hmm. literally for the community like you know they are create their job is just to make stuff for the community to enjoy which i think is fantastic yeah it's again again it's massive like i at the you know what the the thing is i would be very surprised if people that are watching this haven't heard of it that's the thing like very surprised but it's it is it's a skill i think that being able to like there's fine enough being able to like um manage time or manage um i don't know it seems silly but like manage like having a kids and uh, animals and like work and having to manage that but having to manage social media is like a whole nother ball game because like you're fighting algorithms all the time fighting as in in the sense of like figuring out would be a better word there but because mm -hmm. it's constantly changing so like yeah say when you've got um obviously you might not want to say how you do it but say when you've got like a um say we'll say um like a good one is people are just now figuring out how to do a how to work um instagram reels properly like this is a little bit different than it's kind of the same kind of functionality as tiktok a little bit kind of not really but i had they have similar similarities but say when the the algorithm changes and something new comes out and then we'll use tiktok comes out for example say i know it's already but it's just just an example that the how do you then spend because you'll have to spend a lot of time figuring out how the algorithm works to then figure out how hashtag works and then how how do you how do how do you do that or is it literally just just like I was saying now? Well, I mean, like for me personally, I always employ that listen and learn, um, which is I think like the most important thing. I mean, we have in terms of the so like the social team I'm part of, um, so you know it has changed a little bit of recent, but we have people. So I look after the like on the tools Facebook page, and we have people that look after. Uh, so one person looks after like TikTok, Snapchat, and Instagram. Someone, <clears throat> excuse me, looks after YouTube. So like you know, there's there's dedicated uh, editors or coordinators that, that take care of the communities on each platform. Um, so there are certain ways you know to kind of nurture content and analyze things a little different on each platform. But for instance, with Facebook and Instagram, they're linked obviously under the old uh, under Meta and whatnot. Um, so you've got create shooting things where you can analyze very in similar ways, but there's still going to be you know posting forecasts can be different on different platforms what the best time to post is different ways you can analyze data for me it's it you know there's no right way to do it that's that's i think people search for that like you know googling you know yes you can have an idea of you know what google's answer for the best time is but google's answer and our community's answer is going to be different because you know the way you know trades people consume content is going to be different to the way another group's uh, people consume content based off of you know the different content you know when they work you know trace people often start early in the morning and after a couple of hours they will be on fire. so you know we might say so you know, i'm just frequently speaking like we might post something at maybe eight in the morning people go oh it's so early you know because everyone's got the nine five in their head i'm like yeah but trace people don't work nine five but never work nine five they will start early in the morning like they might finish me down on friday so it's about listening and learning and analyzing the data based off of that that's the most important thing. i've been in electric house for a year now and that's the most important thing um that, that I've learned and I've been able to have quite a bit of success in my first year with them just based off of listening and learning and finding ways, you know, when you've got a win, you go, so why was that a win? And you try every single way possible to work out why it's a win. Sometimes you go, it was just right. Like you said earlier, I mean, I've been very fortunate, right place, right time. That piece of content, that video was probably was also right place, right time. But sometimes you can go, right, we've got all these tools now to look at what was the reach on the video? What was the engagement, you know? And then you, you, you know, why was the maybe we, the way we put the caption on the video? Maybe it was the thumbnail. You just look at every bit you can measure, and you just take note of that. And then, like I say, with the good thing with data is, the more data you have, the better you're able to analyze. You know, so then once you got a year, you can look at the years worth of content and start finding patterns. There's there's a million ways to do stuff, Carl, with social media, but I think that's why I find it exciting. You know, you in this role, it's different to before, is I'm able to edit content. And then some things I've made have gone viral. Like the, the best one I've done is I, I edited a video that's done 39 million views. And it was incredible to, to just, you know, it was a simple kind of edit, but it was just that the engagement was huge on it. You know, I had like 200,000 reactions and whatnot and, you know, crazy amount of comments and to see that, but then also be part of the, you know, past that. Because before I'd always say the end process was the edit and then you give it to the client, you give it somewhere and that's it. Now I've been able to go a step further be at the end of doing the edit and then actually be part of where it goes and then look monitoring it afterwards 
mm. you know, which is probably a step I didn't always think about before. No, and it's 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 like when people go into um, you know, when <clears throat> I'll reference myself in this one, when I went into podcasting, I was already doing a little bit like fitness, <laughs> fitness, YouTube, attempting to lift heavy. I'll say quote on quotes because some of these guys are like ridiculously strong but anyway when i was attempting to lift heavy and stuff like that posting hashtags getting engagements getting followers you know picking up i think you know i did i did oh i never did really really well obviously but i did tempted um i att- attempted to do well it's a better way of putting it for myself i think but then with this podcast i was like it's weird because like for example sake when you're posting um just like the way people see it like i'm here and you're there but i'm sure i'm there on the other side of you the, yeah. If you post content like this, someone actually mentioned to this to me. I really should shout them out, but I can't remember who it was. But somebody mentioned it to me. If you post content like this on an Instagram reel or a TikTok, it's not going to get anywhere. And somebody said, asked me like, why that? I asked him why, and he went because the algorithm is detected like blank spaces, so it'll think it's naturally think it's spam. So you have to then manipulate it up. And it literally, I actually put it on my LinkedIn, so people that watch this will see it. It went from having one view to 900 in one day. I was like, how does, like, that's, it, it blew my mind, but then I was like, it's like a game. You have to, like, as you were saying, analyze, and when do I post? If I post in, it's like the same thing. If I post in the morning, um, I'm going to get no, like, no views. Like, that's why I started posting, you know, throughout the day, maybe at 12, 1 o'clock, people are going on their lunch breaks, and then somebody's like to me, why do you post your podcast at uh, 6 o'clock at night? instead of five because everybody posts everybody posts stuff at five and I was like yeah that's it you just said it everybody posts stuff at five mm-hmm. nobody posts stuff at six seven eight o'clock at night nobody does that so that's when people are going to watch it after the tea or after the gym or you know after they've watched the rugby game or after they've been out for a pint or which is yeah. funny for a reason but after they've been out for a pint or something like that they're going to watch it they're not really going to watch it you know it's 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 not as I say like it's easy enough to put to record a video and put it on YouTube. Easy. Everybody has a phone, you know. I mean, anybody can do it. But to do it with a talent of where you realize that um, like you do get views, you do get the reactions, you do get the time and rights. It's it's as you're saying, it's a skill, but once you learn it, you can't implement it into things like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and that. But the way you went about it's quite smart. The, I never even thought about that using Facebook and uh, not you both the Facebook platform you are and then working out when do they finish when do they launch that's yeah yeah but a smart way of doing it to be fair is that like so like you know seeing it as you're uh, um you know uh, working on that page in that say uh, you know is this like um is is this this type of thing that you know that because I know you only work on the it's only the Facebook page you work on isn't it or yeah, so I do, I, I kind of will assist the other kind of coordinators and editors with content. So sometimes I might edit like a snap show for Snapchat or um, I might, you know, send some content. So, you know, predominantly a lot of our stuff UGC, so I mentioned before, user generated content. So we have people that will, you know, go to our submissions website and send clips in, we review it. And if it's appropriate, you know, we think it's good for community, that will, that will go into edits and whatnot. Um, but I will kind of assist the other, the other chaps, like, you know, they'll, um, other people might, do their own edits and whatnot for this but because we all very much that's like what you said the the some of the best people ever worked at with an electric house and we bounce off each other so there is a lot of opportunities for collaboration and stuff so even though i might not be looking after the community i might have you know listened and learned through meetings with people in my team and gone actually you know what that's probably good for tiktok and i recommended a clip and sent it over to my colleague and that did 19 million on tiktok our highest video the other day 90 million views and that's a lot for tiktok you know considering you know we are 1.1 million followers but we're still very much listening and learning compared to you know some mm-hmm. of our competitors um but you know it, it's crazy you know because like when I, I first learned from a colleague um about tiktok and you say you know the better times you know 9 10 11 o'clock later at night and you're like 10 like posting something like that time but it you know it's because you know like i think about it it's probably not best for sleeping but i do scroll through tiktok in bed i know most people do at the end of the day where you just have a before bed not great for sleeping but no, everyone no. does and but it's true and it's like you know it, when you think of lives and stuff you know people will do them late at night you know we've done a few and we're still very much you know listening and learning with tiktok lives but you know it, it it's the ones that in the late in the evening it's just obviously for a job perspective that's not always the best you know it's like who wants to who wants to do the live at nine o'clock tonight um you know i have to propose that one see see how many people put their hands up but uh yeah it's it's that the fundamental part again is it's just it's teamwork with it yeah it's 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 unbelievable as well where i was going with that was i was about to say does 
I take it for your information you've realized on tech and on Facebook, do you just because you said TikTok there, do you recommend that to the person that goes on with TikTok? By the way, I'm posting this at, you know, like you said, eight in the morning and it's really hitting off. How about you post it at eight in the morning and it'll hit off? Is it that type of you kind of like you're saying, you kind of have a little bit of an inf- like, but they'll maybe say, say to someone and be like, look, Sam, I posted this at like you just said, 10 o'clock at night. Maybe you post something at 10 at night and see what it's like. Is it that type of th- environment all the time? Yeah, I think it's it's a case of because there's so much specifics for each platform, you know, that each like each platform has its own best practices and whatnot. You know, even that applies to how we edit content, you know, for instance, Facebook, you know, we've made a predominant focus on editing one one, you know, square and obviously portrait for everything else. So, you know, for instance, like you say, you had that change with how you edited your content. Um, because yeah, obviously the algorithm things can pick up. You know, like you say, dead space that can affect it, but also, you know, you want to edit to edit the content to suit the platform. You know, because people are used to how how it is. You know, it just it is what it is with each platform. So you've got to suit that and have your best practices. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's why it's so important. We have different people to focus on each uh, platform and each community because yeah, it's one whole community. But of course, we have different demographics. You know, Facebook we're probably going to have um, uh, like a an older demographic, you know, kind of consuming media and stuff on Facebook, whereas we generally have a younger demographic and a different split on, say, TikTok. So, you know, you're going to want to make little adjustments there to suit each audience because, you know, even though, yes, they're the same community, that part of the demographic is probably going to, you know, like things a certain way and at certain times on Facebook compared to, you know, the other demographic that's going to want to watch short form content, quick 10, 15 second clips on TikTok, you know. Um, so it, bottom line is, I think, you know, good content. I always say good video. It, it's good. I always think good videos are going to bang regardless. But to make it do even better, you understand your audience. That is the fundamental. Listen and learn. Once again, as my, as my mantra, listen and learn from the community and they'll help you out. Yeah, I totally. And. You know, something that people might be wondering as well, um, not to cut off what we're talking about there, but I just think it'd be wise to explain this a little bit, is that, do you know how, um, obviously, Electric House is the, the company, but is, um, I don't know, act silly for a little, I know the answer to this, but I don't know if people will, so I'll, I'll act silly, as they say, for a second. The brand that you're talking about working on, is that posting it on Electric House's page, or does Electric House, do like loads of brands run under it? Just to explain it to people a little yeah. bit. So originally, uh, the company was just on the tools. So like on the tools limited, that was the company. And um, it kind of like blew up. Like the story has been documented a few times. But basically, um, the the main bosses, uh, Lee and Adam, they wanted to create an app uh, for tradespeople. Like you can find this out on the website and everything. But that was a story um, way back when. And they wanted to create this app. And they created a Facebook page to market the app. And the Facebook page just took off because there was basically one person that was really tech savvy and the other, Adam, who was a former shop fitter tradesperson for 12 years. And um, the Facebook just blew up. And once you started realizing, you know, you could put, you know, uh, you can monetize content and whatnot. And there was a revenue stream there. You, you were like, wow, okay. And they actually ended up sacking off the app. They didn't go, they didn't need to because this, they actually had this Facebook community. And then once it grew and grew, they were to reach out to other, other platforms and grow and actually grow the team. And, you know, they were having like 50, eventually upwards to a couple of years ago, 50, 60 employees working just from the tools. But then obviously they wanted to grow that because that's what they've just done with one brand. So now then they formed Electric House, which is the overall company. So, you know, there is that constant question. You say, who do I work for? Do you say on the tools or Electric House? I might say on the tools because people know of it. But if I want to say, you know, officially, oh, who do you work for? I work for Electric House. So they have other communities like... Um, so we've just changed names, but on a budget is quite a big community on Facebook and other things. Um, so it's like, you know, crafts and hacks and bits and bobs, um, similar UGC content in a way. Um, but obviously that's very much a complete different demographic. Like our, our split is, you know, quite often 80, 20 male to female, whereas there it's completely opposite. Um, and then there's other, we had another community ministry of um, that was mostly pushed on Snapchat and YouTube. And that was kind of all, it's quite it's quite it's unique kind of content you know where it would be exploring things of the unnatural or sometimes supernatural or like you know just things that aren't always covered you know the which is very much quite often done on youtube um and, and content like that so there is a couple and a couple of other brands and then we also work with a lot of clients as well so they took that and just expanded it so if you want to look the ultimate answer is electric house is the umbrella kind of so that's the, the company and it has all the brands sitting underneath it it's like um and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think, I actually don't think I am on this one, that 
um, the uh, it's kind of like uh, I'm trying to think what's it called like um, Dave Portnoy's company Barstool Sports. It's kind of like Barstool, isn't it? Um, in the way of how they have like part of my take, and then they have the Dave Portnoy show, but then they also have like I'm going to get kicked for that by any fans that watch that. But they have so many Umbrella podcasts underneath them. <laughs> But they're owned by Barstool, so you work for that company, but you work in that. It's kind of like that environment, if I'm right in saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah. think you know it can apply to lots of different industries and whatnot. Where you know there's, there's so many just umbrella companies that you know this that obviously are in charge of all of them. But you know it's just then like you identify. I mean, like even just think of like the just in terms of Meta and stuff like with Facebook, could people that work for like you know in the WhatsApp area of Facebook, Instagram? It'd be interesting to like find out you know, if you've interviewed anyone from from those kind of companies or what, you know, if they said, oh, I work for Facebook or I work for, you know, Instagram and stuff, or do you, oh, that I, be interesting? Yeah, yeah, I've, um, I've never spoken to anybody on that side of stuff, but um, I've spoken to it, not on the podcast, um, and they told me not to mention their name, so unfortunately I can't, and I don't think it'd be wise to, but um, people that work for uh, uh, Gymshark, but they actually, they, they, the the it's the the way they explain it is a little bit different. They work for Gymshark, but they work for themselves. But you don't. You work for Gymshark, but you you they pay you, and then you finance yourself. So it's kind of like freelance in a way. But you develop mm-hmm. your own company, but then you work for Gymshark. Excuse mm-hmm. me to do like video editing and like uh, social media designers and things like that. Those type of people. Um, that's what they were saying. But I do know that when you work for um when you work for Instagram and Facebook, because I'm trying to get somebody on from one of those companies right now. Um, mm-hmm. I better men- not mention her name, but I'm trying to. And she said that, uh, no, she, she used to work for Facebook, but now she works for Meta. But she's like very, 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 very down the line. She's not like obviously really high up because those people are like untouchable, as you can imagine. Um, but, you know, and with like, with you working a lot in like social media and that, I, you'll know a lot about like what you can post and what you can't post and things like that. And people that watch the show will know exactly one way to ask is that, do you think you should watch what you post on? Then now, you, well, we'll take, not like on the tools, we'll take that to say just for two minutes. Like you personally, do you think you should watch what you're posting on social media because you do represent even actually, it's even better with yourself because you do represent a literal social media brand. So anything you post will get picked up instantly because somebody will be like, wait a minute, Sam works for Electric House. Wait a minute, on the tool, Sam, I know who that is. Then it gets clicked instantly and it gets brought back. Do you think you should really, you personally, do you think you should really watch what you post on social media? And then the, and then the second part of that question would be like the brand or like people like me who don't work for a company, do you think we should also work, uh, watch what we post? Yeah, I think I think it's probably important because it's 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 like how do you want people to view you online? You know, I always think is is important because I, I always think, especially because like just everything now is saturated, you know, in terms of content creators. It is hard, it's harder than ever was. I mean, you know, you think back to like if you just think about like the like KSI day or P- PewDiePie or something like that, you know, back when it was I think it was in 2005, YouTube was put together, something like that. Um, around then maybe and you think that you know just those people in the first couple of years that just went i'm gonna film game videos i mean i gave it a go a few years ago when i had fraps good old fraps um you know to capture this to, to capture games when i had like first slender game and minecraft back in the day and, and that first came out um and had like a little flip video camera there like it wasn't a webcam i was just using literally a camera and the audio was awful but i i, I at least knew how to edit it you know it's picture in picture style and i gave it a go and it did you know, a few thousand views did okay but then i just but i didn't have the discipline to carry on but just imagine being those chaps that, that found their niche found their audience early on when it was so much easier to grow uh, uh, an audience because it wasn't saturated but back to that i think it's still as important because you just got to you know identify your audience and i think your niche i think that's the most important because yes you might be in um like the genre of content whatever might fall into say on that for instance gaming so that yeah fair enough it's gaming but what you know what's going to separate you what's going to make you a little different um that people are going to go oh actually you know i like his uh, this commentator style i like what he's talking about i like how he presents himself i like the games he plays he or she or you know what what they play you know so i think it's if you can try and identify that as early as possible um, that would obviously really help, you know, develop, you know, an audience and and better the content. But I think it's important to to kind of review how you're just putting yourself out there and the content you're putting 
out to to the world so in that sense you could say yeah you know you should should watch watch it back but it is very difficult it's like for me when i'd have an edit and you'd be so close to that edit and sometimes you'd need to just turn it off not look at the content whatever and come back with set fresh eyes you know and go oh, okay maybe that's not how i wanted you know like and that, that applies to I think any bit of content i think you should always if you've just finished something it might be your baby or whatever but you need to go go away and look at it with fresh eyes i would often get you know other people to look at an edit or something they might go, oh, what about this? And you go, oh, okay, yeah. And then you can have that debate. I think any kind of content that's really important, you know, just to just to you know watch it yourself and just go, is this is this exactly what I want people to see? You know, want people to consume. Yeah, the, and it's it's you, that's a great answer, by the way. Um, but yeah, I think you know, and back to what you were saying about the KSI days. I think everybody, everybody, if, if everybody, I don't know why you wouldn't like him. He's hilarious, but like everybody. Um, kind of knows who he is but they know who the side men are like everybody does everybody there's not i haven't met i've met some uh, some quite famous fitness youtubers to be honest with you like body power and all those sort of like fitness places i've met quite some quite famous ones and they know who the side men are because they make something like they each get about twenty five thousand pound a month and there's like seven of them eight of them seven or eight whatever but yeah, yeah, yeah there's a there's a lot so like they each get paid that amount a month and it's crazy even they've said um that it's crazy the fact that they used to get paid each when they were getting paid a hundred pound a week. They were like, this is crazy. A lot of money, obviously, because that's, you know, seven, eight hundred pound a week, but for the mm-hmm. company, but for them, that's how much they were getting paid. And now they're saying it's, and it's all because they learned how the algorithm works with YouTube. Like just like to go back, to take a, a, a um, kick over the tail, as they say, that it all goes back to like learning how the algorithm works, learn how YouTube works, learn how mm-hmm. thumbnails, like, um, I'll, uh, I'll shout him out because he, uh, I know he watches my shows, but uh, Kareem Fawaz, who's the guy that's the show that's, as this is like, as we're recording this, he's live right now. His show's live right now. Um, he was the one that said, you know, you're, you're, uh, this is like a criticism to me, as was like, you know, you're, as because I asked him for uh, critical feedback. And he said, look, amazing show, but you've got in your titles, like the name of the person. For example, we used my very first, the very first guest I had on was Marcus Nash. And he said, look, he was like, I know who Marcus Nash is because he's a Hearts fan and now he works at uh, Leicestershire. So he's a Leicestershire fan. Um, and he was like, look, but nobody else knows who he is. Like no mm. one. So you need to then change the titles to have each what it's about in the titles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the views have just shot off. And I was like, I never even thought of doing that. Like this is just a weird thing. It's like, it's literally i think social media is one and i'm sure you agree social media because it's ever evolving and the trends are ever changing you're constantly learning where yeah and it's what um what i'd be interested in thinking your you know your opinion on it as well with working in it um where do you think social media is you know where would you think the next social media modem is going to be like do you think because a lot of people say and just give this a bit of context a lot of people say um I don't know if it's just a rumor. It might be a rumor, but I guess you never know. But apparently YouTube is featuring, a, um, they're kind of going to bring like a Instagram slash Twitter style to YouTube. And if they do, that'll be, that'll, that'll explode. That'll, that, that will explode straight off. But then again, obviously now people are saying Instagram might, Instagram or Twitter, I know Twitter have Twitter spaces now, which is huge, which is just like Clubhouse really. Um, but they're uh, well, it's exactly like Clubhouse, to be honest, but they're, uh, they, they, they're now saying they might actually be able to bring a bit, I know you can upload YouTube, but you'll have like your old YouTube type thing channel on that. And same with Instagram. Instagram said the same as well. We're going to come out, I know it's on their Facebook, but they said we're going to come out and we're actually going to have a bit where you can upload, you know, 10 to 15 minute content to then two hours if you get approved for it on top of your, on top of your Instagram page. So, but where do you, obviously they're just room. I hope that does happen because that would be so cool. But where, uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Where do you think the social media is going to... Obviously, then you've got the metaverse and things like that, but mm-hmm. where do you think it's going to take us, in a way? I think, yeah, the metaverse very much, I think that's very much early days. I think that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna be like, you know, like, like a 10, 15-year kind of constant. There'll probably be little updates, but in terms of, you know, like look at the growth of TikTok and that journey and the, the way that's, you know... I think, you know, it's one of those that, that there's so many things you can get into this, you know, that make the profit of the... Um, pandemic as well you know because very much tiktok's been the last kind of two to three years the insane growth but then hopefully the option of that you know being able to do monetized content that tiktok lives getting more and more you know brands actually choosing to go to tiktok now i mean uh, hootsuite recently did their report on kind of upcoming trends and whatnot going forward 
um, with TikTok being that kind of main option that clients are going to be you know, wanting to get invested in now, getting their brand and everything on TikTok. And I think is with other platforms, like say with YouTube, there's more tools and stuff to get user interaction with the audience now so you know with obviously the rise of podcasts over the last you know five to ten years um like you know integrating those with the apps and whatnot like when we do when we do a live so we have um on, on the tools we have a uh, talking trade bi-weekly um live show that we do with trades people we have guests and we will have virtual guests and we have like a little small studio a couple of guests and a couple of hosts um, and then we'll have, you know, bits of content going in, but we'll often do like a BTS TikTok live as well. It's just utilize all the platforms. I think, I think lives are going to uh, just more, you know, cause before back in the day, like a live stream was just some of you, like maybe a webinar or something. I don't even know, like growing up, you just didn't hear it as much. Whereas now, like you'll be scrolling, you scroll on TikTok. It's just people live streaming all over the world. Really like someone in the bedroom or someone could literally be dancing in a studio or someone could be doing a really high end something that's backed by TikTok, like our lives we do are backed by TikTok because we work with the platforms due to the size of communities. Mm -hmm. um, I just think there's gonna be more live, live streams and more options for user engagement outside of contents and reactions and usual engagement. Um, you know, like like you say, with that change with, with Instagram and it's also short form content as well now because, you know, people are looking for a, a reason to switch off with content, you know, um, especially with TikTok because it's one, one, you know, it's one click. It's so easy. Like I always say it's with stories content as well. Like when you have different story cards, if you want them to get through a five card story, you've got to keep engaging with like stickers, polls and whatnot, because people are literally looking for that reason to switch off. Mm. Um, so you've got to somehow give them something to keep them there. But yeah, I just think it's going to be more user interaction and more, more folks on the lives. Yeah, as well, as well, to be honest with you, as well as like, um, you know, I think that it's eventually going to lead to the part of where you're going to have, uh, um, obviously, lives and like you're saying, but it was funny, and to, to change to change the way I'm going to ask this, this question is that I remember when uh, I first went on TikTok, uh, Instagram, sorry, and I was like, you know, what, I could probably turn a business into this, like, I don't know how, I don't know how I was thinking about it. this, is obviously, seven years ago because I've not always had it I was never like a social media guy it's only since I've been involved in like uh, music and podcasts and, and media type stuff that I've actually been like you know I should really have my own content and I mind going to a hairdresser the person that used to cut my hair and I said that uh, nice girl really nice girl I said I was like look have you ever have you got Instagram and stuff this was years ago mind and um, she does now but do you have Instagram and stuff she was like no I've never I don't know how you do that I've never she was an older woman I, was, I don't know about this I don't know about that I'm very scared of technology and all sort of stuff I said I could actually help you turn that um, and she was like well do you want in return that was like just like a small a tiny tiny fee I think it was like 50 quid a month or something like that mm -hmm. but this was six years ago six years six seven years ago I see twenty minutes. 20. Yeah, seven years, seven years ago, seven years ago this year actually. That's crazy. But um, I know she pays somebody five hundred and ninety pound a month now to manage her social media, and I know that's not even expensive. That's the thing. I know, I know people that charge more, but I'm like, see if you just took. It's it, it's crazy the way that things are evolving. Everything's now yeah. going on. It's 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 it blows her mind. But what well, um, I always before um, I you know before we finish that up and like. As you know yourself, I, I, like, I like to get guests social media and I just to promote themselves and stuff. But before we do that, though, um, I have two questions I want to ask um, okay. because I think it's always amazing because it's been an amazing, amazing show to be honest. And uh, I do appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Um, but I do want to ask you these two questions that we know. Um, you might know I'm going to ask you might not. Is that um, the first one is a. Uh, See when um you know obviously you do a lot of professional work. I would personally say like, and it's not me. I don't mean like your work, your work, work, but like you do a lot of professional work for a company and things like that. What would you say is your biggest um flaw personally and professionally, in your opinion? I think uh, I'd probably say yeah, personally and professionally, because they probably go hand in hand on this one. Is um I do suffer with anxiety and have done for a number of years and and kind of overthinking Sorry, situations. Hmm. Second. I'm saying sorry, hear that man. That's sorry. I feel, yeah, it, I feel for you on that. It's it's a tricky one because then you know it you 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 second guess a lot of things and a lot of opportunities and and a lot of it could be like the capacity is huge and that could be you know uh, an edit is it good enough is it, you know and then you go am I good enough as an editor and then you just try and take that step back and uh, that that can go to any level you know am I good enough to to uh, you know, go for this, maybe go for this promotion. Am I good enough to do this? Am I, am I good enough to, to take the fantastic invitation that you sent? 
uh the other month you know for this great for this great call and and to, to be on part of the podcast and this show and and you know every i do that pretty much with most things um especially when it's something new and like you you know and there's my brain is just going over in circles over you know thinking about all of the the reasons why i shouldn't do something and i'm just trying to push them out of the way to find the reason why i, I am doing it and why i should do it um but I, i've you know luckily i think it's something i'll probably always suffer with but i've found different ways uh, of, of coping with that and and different ways to to really take perspective i think that's something that i've tried to do um the last few months is just take perspective on you know where i am and what i'm doing and the reasons for why i'm doing these things and um and just try not to to let the head get too bogged down with all those negative thoughts and whatnot just go you know what you're doing all right <laughs> you know you you're here and and you're here that you're there for a reason and just yeah just taking taking perspective good yeah i appreciate your comment by the way but i do want to ask you were saying about um again sorry to hear about your anxiety like you know it, it's i'm i'm very um what's the word i know what you're talking about when it comes to that i don't really talk about my mental health a lot i know you should and all this sort of stuff but i just don't i know i know all about anxiety and stuff because you know and like you said again i really appreciate your comment but it's the other way around as well for me to reach out and to speak to hundreds of people all the constantly and i know i don't have hundreds of people on my show but you have to message you know 100 people to get five people on your show just i mean joe rogan said the same thing when he first started out because he was even though he was kind of known people still don't want to come on his show so like no we don't know who you are so it does take a lot to like um mention and meet the people and meet new people all the time and that but um and i know i uncovered it uncovered would uncovered be the word yeah uncovered it would be the word yeah i would say um I was just like, you know what, you know what, these people are probably in the same boat. Obviously, I didn't know, but I was like, these people might be in the same boat as me. So I was like, you know what, they might want to come on the show and be too afraid to ask. So you ask people and they're like, yeah, I was really thankful you asked. I wanted to, I wasn't sure, you know, because my anxiety or my mental health for that just was like, ah, I don't know, like, I don't know if I'm good enough and so on. But I just kept asking and asking and asking and eventually I got used to it. And now it just becomes like second nature, really. But what was your obstacle that you were like how did you manage to get over it and things like that you're right or you know obviously you still have anxiety and so did I I'll admit but you 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 learn to um deal with it more and develop a kind of like a tolerance to like that that thing that's telling you no don't do that you develop a tolerance to it but how did you if you have done how did you manage to develop that tolerance and get over it a little bit I think to be fair Carl I think in in um in my previous job at Lemon Zest, you know, it was um, quite a high pressure environment. You had to, you had to learn to be able to work, you know, against deadlines and, you know, in live environments where, you know, you, you've got to get it bang on, like, you know, whether that's just how you, you know, you, you when you're a cam up in or, you know, live mixing or whatever. And, you know, that was quite, you know, in the search to have anxiety in an environment like that, there was some real, like, you know, boiling points at times. But I, I must say, um, at one point when it was it was really getting bad, um, like I was actually in quite a dark place. I must say, um, it wasn't good at all. My um, my boss at the time, Paul, he, uh, he he you know he reached out because he actually suffered with the same things. And like sometimes, you know, where there'd be boiling points both sides, it was actually crazy. This one conversation we had, where I learned that he suffered in similar ways. But obviously, it's that different side because that's where this is going back to the perspective thing. Because you know, you might not have thought of his anxieties as a business owner. It's all on him. Do you know what I mean? He's got to manage, you know, just any kind of management as well. You got to manage your people and like they're not, you know, on it or whatnot, or they're, you know, dealing with that. And he obviously noticed that, and he reached out to me, and he actually supported me. And the so did my other um, other boss as well, Louise. They 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 actually supported me um, and helped me get uh, counselling at the time, and that's through work. You know, it was it was fantastic, and it meant that I was able to deal with some issues and problems I had personally. But you know, my biggest thing is I didn't want to it to affect work because you know I'm professional, I enjoy my job. It was actually affecting my work, and that's like the last thing. And then that makes it worse because you're overthinking and you're getting down because you're like, oh, you know. Um, you know, ruining my job here and whatnot. And they actually supported me all in that. And by doing that counselling, you know, I really, I really kind of am an advocate for that because it helped me massively. Because the issue is, you know, I am so lucky with the circles I've got of friends and family, but overthinking again, you worried about putting stuff on their plate um and you know being a burden to them even though you they'll say you're not but in your head you are that burden you don't want to be so you know by meeting this complete stranger you know they're professional they got trained and whatnot but even if they didn't have that the fact you're just talking to a stranger 
you know, they, they don't know anything about you. They're not going to judge you for anything like that. They, they you know, they, they're pretty much, you know, once some sessions go on, you're probably not going to see them again. It actually helped massively. And he was able to put some kind of coping techniques, you know, just breathing techniques, self-meditation. It sounds so simple. And you'd think, oh, you know, just go and pay that money or whatever. And, oh, you could have just found it on YouTube. But you wouldn't, you know, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's the initial conversations getting down to the roots of things and you know just doing it with someone and like breathing techniques and whatnot and it helps massively because you just need to take that time out and just once you have that that help to work out what the problems were and maybe what's caused them because we did get quite a lot into that you can then try and find obviously certain little ways to not really find a cure because i don't think there ever will be one for for stuff like this you know i, I always say everyone's got mental health do you know what i mean like everyone's gonna have the rough times and stuff it's just finding ways to once again like take perspective and go okay, what can I do to, to maybe help the situation? You just need to step away. Just need to quickly put my headphones on. Do I need to just do a quick breathing thing and take a step away? And, you know, that sometimes that five minutes can just, you know, completely resolve a situation in terms of, you know, not having a, a crazy, you know, meltdown or like boiling over or something. Mm. So, yeah, just little things like that, I think, Carl, yeah. Yeah, good. And what, like, what I like an amazing motivational note to end on, to be honest with you, the fact that, like, you're another person like um it's always great to hear to be honest and uh everybody will know the the name of the podcast that went kind of crazy a little bit as in the sense of views and stuff it, it blew i was blown away so much i actually messaged uh, the boy derek i actually messaged him and i was like look things you said like people are actually coming to me and be like you know i've you've helped me and you've helped this it was, it was mental but well again what amazing note to end on to be honest with you it just shows you that you can literally overcome everything that's the thing mm-hmm. it takes it could take you know um, it will take hours or days or weeks it could take months or even years but there does come to a point where you will like eventually overcome it and you know become better and stuff like that so yeah good it goes good. back to um goes back to tom hanks with this too shall pass it's yeah, uh, exactly. it, I, I want it on a shirt or something like i'm gonna there's a few lines and a few things i'll always live by and i just you know when things just stick out and resonate with you like honestly i'll, I'll have to send you the the link to that it's a brilliant the, the whole series is fantastic because you just yeah. watch it and talk yeah. like that <laughs> Please do, yeah. If you get on a hat on my next show, you could have literally on my hat and you'd be like, ah, no, I told him to do that. There we go, there we go. You could start a hat company with motivational quotes in it. There we go, it's in that business. There we go. <laughs> Little side hustle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But anyway, um, yeah, um, just before we go, though, again, thank you. Thanks so much for your time. It was really interesting. And I appreciate your time. And obviously, like, um, we, we, you know, you've had such, you, you're, you're, you're genuinely obviously moving in and then, you know, various other obstacles and that, um, that will keep between us that you, you know, you were going through and stuff. So the fact that you managed to actually give me time and give me like an hour, an hour and a half, however long it's been, you know, I really do appreciate that. But what also, like I was saying, um, and people will know this, that I like to get people on social media just because so I can like promote yourself. Oh, it can be like, it can be anything, whether it's your social medias or um, it'd be kind of better if it was yours. Cause obviously I like to promote the person because if you're working on something, then people come back to you rather than, a company but again it's up to yourself it's what's them but if you do what is your instagram and twitter or anything like that? um i mean to be fair i'd probably send you over to my website um just because it's it there's i haven't had that much time to work on personal projects but there's my kind of uh portfolio of short films and documentaries i've done on there so you can watch them there you can either go on my vimeo account by just searching my name so samuel lardner um or if you just go on um, samueljlardner.com you can go on my website and just see some of like my photography work and some of the films i'll be edited or or kind of uh, produce myself yeah that'd be great and just so like um because i know you just said it but i'll get you to send me them over because and i'll put them in as everybody knows they're always in the, the description below and then um, you'll also be able to find him um, sam is with this as well because you're um you're they go up on instagram and twitter and um, obviously you know i like i like praising the guests that come on because again like as i say to people right now this is really small so the fact that guests come on it means it does mean the works it just helps that little bit more but again thank you very much for coming on thanks everybody for watching listening um again apparently we're on this new form called breaker whatever that is i know it's a version of spotify but you can have to sign up for an account it's a little bit different but i know it's like very um they use uh they use the the kind of like wav files as well so it's, it's very 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 condensed it sounds it sounds amazing to be honest with you um but yeah anyway thank you very much for watching it uh, thanks again sam and uh, everybody have a good night thank you very much